Welcome to Radio Evolve, our weekly webcast for consciousness and culture. I welcome very much uh, for this broadcast tonight, Jamie Johnson. Jamie, you are he here online. Yes. Hi. Hi, Thomas. Thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be back. Jamie, great to have you here. Uh, uh, if I just may introduce you, you are a podcaster yourself. You are an integral thinker. You are president of the uh, oh, <laughs> uh, uh, Gene Gapser Society, that's right. <laughs> society, sorry. The Gene Gapser Society. And you are uh, someone who very closely uh, observed the elections in the USA right now. And uh, we thought to have a conversation about the elections in the US They are not still over. We don't know who will be uh, the president of the United States. Tell me, uh, what is uh, what is the situation right now? How do you perceive what's going on in the U.S.? Uh, what is the situation in the middle of a very unusual election campaign? Well, wow. <laughs> election campaign, but a campaign that is not over yet. Yeah, good question. I think that's the that's the uh, question everyone is asking. What is the situation right now? Uh, in terms of the numbers and the stats, we're still sitting at uh, 250 electoral votes for Biden and 214 for Trump. We're still waiting for Nevada and Arizona, as well as uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Georgia. So uh, everyone is is kind of waiting, as I mentioned in my email last night, on bated breath here uh, for the election results. Uh, obviously, tensions are very high. Um, protests have been developing across the country, and we have accusations, of course, from uh, the Trump campaign of, of uh, voter fraud, and there's calls to count the votes or to not count the votes. So um, you could say, you know, putting it lightly or understating it, uh, things are very frenetic and chaotic here and very tense um, and unfortunately drawn out. Uh, I just feel like that that has been the, the situation this year, but... This is where we are at the moment. <laughs> so we are here and it's, uh, I mean, it's quite a situation. After four years of Donald Trump, uh, many believed that there would be a decisive win of uh, the Democrats, uh, a decisive win of the Democratic candidate. Uh, but it seems that uh, Biden uh, is maybe winning, but not Not in the way everyone expected. Why is this so? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, part of this has to do with, with uh, the, the second election in a row with this uh, 365 polling. Um, there, there's a lot of loss of faith, actually, in, in, in the polling process. Uh, and, you know, at this point, I think it's a little too early to talk about uh, what the reasons for That is, um, I think there's going to be a lot of postmortem analysis of the failure of these uh, polling algorithms and uh, predictions uh, to be so drastically wildly off for a second election uh, in, you know, four years or so. But, you know, that being said, I think, you know, if we look at the material reality on the ground, uh, we see, you know, just based on the how close this election is, that, you know, Even with the uh, highest voter participation since, I think, 1908 in the United States, uh, we still have a close call, which means a lot of people are still voting for Trump. And in fact, you know, I think Trump's numbers have gone up uh, about 3% of uh, the GOP. So more people have voted for Trump this year than in 2016. So these are all very interesting numbers and they are wildly different than what of uh you know I think a lot of the political pundits were saying in terms of the way things should have turned out, which was uh Biden was far ahead in the polls and he was expected to win definitively. And, you know, as far as we know right now, it looks like he's inching towards a victory, but that victory is way too close for comfort. So it raises a lot of uh, socio-political questions about, okay, well, why was Trump once again uh, so successful in terms of drawing voters out for the GOP? So in some way, the whole world is kind of stunned again. Uh, I mean, uh Four years ago, uh, Donald Trump, uh, everyone was surprised. Everyone was shocked. 
but it was kind of an accident, uh, everyone thought, that uh, someone like him uh, uh, could have been elected uh, to, to be president of the United States. So we had four years of Donald Trump, four years of what he is standing for, and it seems that uh, at least it's close again for the American electorate to vote again for someone like Donald Trump. Um, although it's very soon, uh, uh, but I would like to ask the question, what are the deeper reasons for this situation from an integral perspective, from an integral point of view? Mm-hmm. If you try to understand the American society of what is going on and uh, what is happening, uh, maybe not just in the U.S., but maybe uh, in the whole West, why is the phenomenon of Donald Trump as persistent as it seems to be? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for for uh, for an integralist looking at this situation, the context is the rise of particularly authoritarian leadership, uh, which leans towards the quasi-fascist or fascist aspirational uh, that leans towards the the xenophobic. Um, and, and I think, you know, this is, again, part of a larger process. We might call it a cultural devolution, but what I think we're really seeing is uh, a number of different factors that need to be taken account uh, at the kind of planetary scale. Like, number one, of course, we have this climate crisis, which Trump has been very uh, willingly denialistic about it and a lot of other uh, uh, folks are as well but part of this i think is the failure of a particular all right so starting at like the surface level a particular economic ideology uh capitalism we might say you know uh, um, is is its logic is uh towards of course extraction accumulation of wealth uh uh, exponential growth, etc. But there's a kind of sense-making process that that's behind that economic ideology that I think has been driving uh, the gears of modernity for hundreds of years. And I think for the really uh, for the first time, we're coming up against uh, an existential crisis with what we're facing in terms of uh, the climate crisis. So there's that, and I think what we're seeing is a kind of withdrawal from the planetary commons or a withdrawal from the context of the planetary, a kind of escape, right? Putting up of walls and borders and boundaries, a a, a will to ignorance, as uh, uh, Nietzsche talked about in terms of uh, acknowledging the climate crisis and a a gathering up of what, you know, in terms of the economic and global elite can take with them. Just uh, if if you see this, I mean, there's been a decade of of anti-globalization movements and uh, economic disruption, of course. In 2020, we had uh, the the economic crisis, uh, the biggest since uh, the 1930s. So so we're seeing a lot of disruptions. And I think we're seeing a lot of people who are uh, scared, uh, understandably so, and looking for scapegoats. They're looking for particular lines of thought that give them comfort that uh, might have a sense of uh, security or knowing what's going on, right, an avoidance of complexity. So I think a lot of these are the kind of dimensions we're dealing with here, which is a massive restructuring, not only of our socio-political lives, but really, you know, our sense-making. Um, the question I think we're, we're dealing with, which is not being addressed, is what does what does cultural evolution look like after modernity, right? From everything from our economics, right, in our extractive ideology to, you know, what is a more biospheric compatible economic and and social system actually going to look like? And can we achieve this at a a planetary scale, right? Um, One final thought about this, we have a lot of commentary on like globalization and neoliberalism, et cetera. But I think the context of that is globalization is not the same from an integral perspective as planetization. And I think generally speaking, we're kind of at a cul-de-sac. Uh, globalization doesn't lead to planetization. We're seeing a kind of deflation and a withdrawal. And so I think we need to, we need a lot of, uh, side real ideas, right? Ideas coming from the sidelines, coming from the periphery to begin to think about how we can make our way through this. Uh, I know that's a big answer, but it's a big question. (laughs) 
let me paraphrase my question. Sure. Uh, if we look uh, at our global situation, uh, as you have described it, the climate crisis, let's call it the crisis of capitalism, uh, let's uh, uh, also the will to ignorance, as you described it. Aren't we in a situation where maybe at least the last uh, 300 years, uh, this is the first time where the civilization really has no clue where to go? Mm. Mm. I mean that there is a deep meaning crisis that um, for the last 300 years there was something that was called uh, modernity, and to some degree, postmodernity, at least in some ways of its, uh, the way it unfolded, was just uh, a continuation of modernity as a culture that's based on free market, uh, that's based on individuality, uh, that's based on progress, uh, that's based on a certain relationship uh, to our planet, which means that we really can use the planet for our technological needs. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this all seems to not work anymore. And at the same time, America, uh, for the last uh, 200 years, or, uh, at least for the last 100 years, was on the helmet of this development. The U.S., stands for what the West stands for, stands for progress, stands for uh, the progress also on, on, on social development. All this uh, seems to not work anymore at this point. And there is a huge irritation, confusion, how our global future can look like. And particular in the US more than anywhere else, uh, the U.S. being very identified with this role of being the front runner of this modern development, uh, doesn't America have kind of an identity crisis? Who America is and who America should be? Mm. Sure. Uh, you generally speaking, um, yeah, you're giving a good uh, kind of macro trajectory here. Uh, the sense of modernistic progressive time right that next year we'll make more money next year we'll have more technology uh progress continues that kind of march of linear time which is not just you know uh, a, a capitalistic concern it's not just a concern of the markets but this is a deep rooted sense making orientation what you know gene gepser would call the, the perspectival world or perspectival consciousness as you mentioned the the um emphasis on the individual and you know um, the united states i think has had a very uh, unique role in the 20th century you're right in in and reiterating that structure of consciousness and revivify, revivifying it in a particular sense uh, for the past you know, two or three hundred years as well, um, particularly in the 20th century, uh, and particularly after in terms of uh, in terms of uh, the mid-century with the post-war. So that particular arc or, or life cycle seems to have uh, spent itself. And there's various reasons and analysis we can get into historically, but I do think it comes down to an identity crisis, number one. And number two, you know, we have to begin to consider that the age of uh, the industrial nation state, right, uh, in the context in which the United States has flourished in the world and the world of globalization has flourished, uh, might also be coming to an end and what does that actually mean you know in the context of are we going to uh fragment right because we, we've seen hyperpolarization culturally speaking in the united states and abroad so we have a kind of fragmentation of culture and we're seeing this take place in the united states uh there isn't a sense of unity there isn't a sense of collective direction anymore and, you know, part of this is, I think, as you're saying, uh, a loss of, of meaning making, a loss of a kind of mythos uh, or national myth making to kind of cohere many different people. And the United States has always been an experiment, right, because 
uh, of its of its pluralistic tendencies, um, a nation built especially in the 20th century by immigrants. So a lot of that is breaking down, and I think uh, to to some extent what we've seen in this election is is uh, you know on the one hand as it's breaking down a desire to return to an imagined past that was more coherent, and I think of course the Trump uh, campaign was running on that. Uh, and then also a desire to continue progress, culturally speaking, in terms of equality, uh, social justice, etc. Uh, but in the center, I think what we're really missing is, is a, again, a, a, a healthy sense of, of helping people on the ground and actually building these bridges, these mediational bridges between different uh, cultures and polarities. And, and that takes a lot of work. And I think that also takes a economic and social system that is less dissociated with material, the material reality on the ground. And unfortunately we don't live in that context, right? Um, so uh, that's kind of my, my meandering response here in the sense that, yeah, there is, there is a meaning crisis and I think it's, it's deeply ontological. It's, it's the very structure of consciousness in, uh, through which the United States has so problematically and also marvelously expressed uh, in, in the last few centuries. Hmm. I mean, as you expressed, and I would agree with you, uh, Trump's uh, campaign is very much a campaign for an imagined past to make America great again, and also for uh, the American white working class and their own past, more the one they imagined than they really had in a situation where uh, this past won't happen again. Let's uh, assume that Biden will win this. Let's assume that Biden will be the president and uh, he most likely won't have the Senate. He won't be able uh, to uh, make two big projects at the same time. But someone like Biden, what can he offer for the further development of the US in this situation? What can he offer for the development of culture and social development um, that really would make a difference. It's not just a repetition of the United States uh, under Clinton, under Barack Obama. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, unfortunately, as you know, like my my own uh, political affiliation is much more progressive. So mm -hmm. my honest answer would be, there, he wouldn't really be offering anything different than before. And in fact, his entire campaign has been running on a, a return to, uh, to normalcy. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, there's that critique. On the other hand, obviously having, you know, Biden in, in the White House would, would do some good work to stabilize and give the progressive, uh, movement that's uh, very much in, in its in its early phases, just in terms of if we think about uh, progressive populism in the United States, it's really only been uh, politically reawakened um, in through the Bernie campaign. I mean, he's he's really kind of revivified the political project in terms of the down ballot victories uh, we're seeing uh, during this during this round. Um, actually, that one of the good things about this is um on the down ballot in, in Congress, at least, we're seeing a lot of representatives who are coming from the DSA and other progressive platforms, uh, in majority win their campaigns, uh, which is good, about a 70% success rate, which is really good politically speaking. So it bodes well for the future. And really the, the idea of the Biden administration here is he, he's probably going to need a lot of pressure from progressives to really get anything, anything accomplished or, or really kind of move in that political direction. Um, so that's really the kind of um, response I have is that a lot of this is, is really going to need to be on the ground. And at least a, a, the, the Biden administration would stabilize things enough perhaps, uh, for that work to happen. Because as far as the Democratic leadership is concerned in the U.S., um, uh, I, I don't see the leadership really addressing uh, the issues that are on, on the ground and not really understanding why this election was so close. So I think the, the it's really going to be up to the progressives to really kind of do that on-the-ground material work in terms of um, 
speaking to economic issues, working class issues, and really actually bridging the divide. Um, unfortunately, you know, I think on the left, we, we have a sort of um, a Janus faced a situation, right, where on the one hand, the left is seen as is um, part of a polemic uh, dance with the right, we, you know, Trump voters, and we have Black Lives Matter, and then we have the MAGA folks, right, or QAnon. Uh, when really the, the, the mediational ground uh, is being laid by uh, communities and organizations like the DSA that are actually trying to uh, bring together and align progressive values with uh, questions about class, economics, material needs, health care, et cetera. So, you know, we're looking for these bridges. We're looking for this bridge work. And again, I think the Biden administration would at least give us a breath. Uh, it, it would allow us to take a breath and actually have some space to do this work. And it's going to be a lot of work. I, I don't think uh, the Biden administration itself is going to automatically move, move to the left, especially with a conservative Senate. Actually, we're probably going to see a very conservative uh, cabinet in terms of uh, in terms of what Biden might be choosing, should he win. So there's going to be a lot of work to do. There's no easy answers, right? There's no really comforting answers, but at least there is a sense of what needs to get done. But what is it that needs to be get done and what can be done? If we just uh, recapitulate also uh, mm -hmm. the way we opened uh, this conversation, that this crisis is a very big crisis. That's a cultural crisis of uh, the modernist West America being the helmet of that, uh, that uh, there's something that comes to an end. Uh, it's not just neoliberalism. It's maybe really 500 years of Western modernist development. Uh, and America is very much identified with being uh, the helmet of this. And there is uh, a deep identity crisis. Uh, who are we in this situation where we can go? Trump, in his own, um, let's call it fascist way, wants to go back to something that kind of uh, holds white supremacy, uh, uh, all the not so great values of uh, these Western cultures against an unknown future. There is a Biden uh, government, maybe, that wants to hold something like the status quo, a progressive and an integral progressive agenda that can make some change. Um, what would be the agenda about and what are the chances and uh, the ways to develop this agenda? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there's there's um, a kind of micro-macro perspective here in terms of the context, the larger evolutionary context, right? We are transitioning away from capitalistic modernity and there are no really uh, substantive uh, uh, blueprints in terms of what is emerging, what is actually coming up next. But I do think we have themes and motifs and characteristics we can look for. So that's sort of the macro, and I'll cycle back to that. But I think immediately, to kind of give us a concrete example, with the left um, and progressive, uh, the progressive agenda in the, uh, under a Biden administration, I think it really breaks down to a few different factors, a few different uh, immediate projects. Uh, number one, I think, is is a kind of the reconstruction and the revivifying of the labor movement. I think uh, in terms of, you know, the sheer amount of economic uh, disparity that has happened in this in this year, you know, the greatest transfer of uh, economic wealth in, in modern history has occurred over the summer um, that Yanis Varoufakis uh, commented on. Um, so a reconstruction of, of, of the labor movement is, is one of the top priorities that uh, progressives are, are really emphasizing here. Um, and it's promising to see it, at least in, you know, New York and more uh, kind of progressive oriented urban environments uh, of the building of socialist institutions. Right. And then the third thing is um, the electoral bench. And Megan Day lays this out. She's a great uh, um, uh, leftist theorist and uh, commentator on Jacobin magazine. I highly recommend um, uh, her recent writing about this, but in terms of the down ballot victories, and none of this looks very pretty. None of this looks easy. It's all bottom up 
uh, building of infrastructure again. But what's the context for this? And I think it's the context is uh, third spaces uh, in terms of labor consciousness, in terms of intermediary organizations between the government and the people that aren't just corporations uh, really need to be revivified in this century. And there's a hunger for that. And this kind of brings me back to the macro in the sense that people are desiring for the commons again, you know, we space, uh, as, as we might say, social cohesion, uh, collectivity, a belonging in the social imaginary and actual viable means in which to do so. Uh, this is where the labor movement thrived. This is where healthy social and socialist institutions had thrived previously in the United States. They've been slowly eroded. Um, and what we've, we've had over the past century, really the past few centuries are, um, an increasing, and this goes along with the perspectival consciousness, an increasing atomization, increasing individual, uh, ind- individualization, right? Uh, we, we've, we've had this loss of an intersubjective and shared space. And I think there's a hunger for that and there's a desire to find a way to recreate it. So in terms of cultural evolution, I don't think it's going to look like just, you know, going back to what unions were like in, you know, 1920 or 1915. Uh, I think they're going to have to be reinvented. And the way in which we come at these third spaces and these social spaces and revivify the commons are going to be some of the uh, most immediate challenges, I think, for for us in cultural evolution in that context. Uh, M- Michelle Bowens talks quite a bit about this with uh, his work in uh, in peer to peer foundation in the Commons. So I think that's that's a really big uh, agenda, uh, and and this is not just, of course, in the United States. I think this is um, a kind of post capitalist agenda, which is how do we bring back uh, the Commons? How do we retrieve the Commons? And what does a post capitalist world look like? Um, what does an aperspectival world look like and what do its institutions, uh, how do its institutions reflect that? I think this is our immediate struggle <laughs> and we're not even talking about climate or anything yet, right? <laughs> we're not talking about climate. We, uh, we're also not talking about the imminent COVID crisis. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we, we are not talking, uh, you, you did mention uh, that basically uh, in, in the context of the COVID crisis, there is a huge transfer of power and wealth uh, happening right now, there is also a, a huge restructuring of uh, the power structures of our society with the digitalization and the big three uh, digital companies. Uh, in that, uh, what you're proposing as an uh, integral perspective and an integral strategy to respond to this crisis, how does this differ from a traditional progressive socialist agenda? Mm, mm. I think in some ways it doesn't, and in some ways it does. Now, again, the the left, and this is why I've been floating around the the, the concept of the integral left uh, playfully, and also to kind of engage in a, sort of understanding why we might feel an aversion to take one emphasis or the other. I think the left traditionally in the 20th century has... Uh, held out a placeholder for the future in the sense that there's been a lot of critiques of capitalism, you know, in terms of Marxist thought and the history of uh, the success of socialism outside of the United States in terms of socialistic aspects of government. And, you know, Europe is a better, you know, example of of this, but certainly it's it's something that most of the world has integrated to some degree, but that's not enough. Um, what I think we're going to really need to do in this sense is uh, incorporate both, you know, technological solutions to uh, maybe uh, previous issues that weren't able to uh, get off the ground just in terms of the democratization of work, uh, decentralization of, of, of economics. Uh, so I think technology might actually or could potentially play a very important role in what this looks like. Uh, on the other hand, I think some of the same principles just in terms of the left haven't really changed, which is we know that you know, and again, this is where an integral perspective is useful, that if capitalism is an expression of, of a, a collapsing perspectival mental world in terms of a structure of consciousness, then we we do need to look to um, new models of economics and new social institutions that would reflect the integral or a perspectival world. So that's the, that's the, the, the kind of challenge we're up against, I, I suppose. Um, but 
you know, again, it, it is both similar to what we've already seen, and then also, I think, finding new ways to to revivify itself. Um, and I think the commons is a big focus for us. I think rethinking the commons and thinking in terms of in the context of the biosphere, right? Like we're we're in the macro again. The looming horizon here is the climate crisis, right? Is is the um, you know the inability for extractive capitalism to continue in a time in which you know the biosphere is not going to let us do that. So uh, can we begin to experiment? With, let's say, I think Daniel Christian Wall talks quite a bit about this, uh, regenerative economic models that are bioregional, perhaps, or at least biospheric, that might be more cyclical than, uh, uh, exponential in terms of infinite growth. What are these kinds of things? I think we're going to have to experiment with them quite a bit to really get them right. What do you think in this context, the responses that we, we have from progressives, uh, and most, at least what we hear here in, uh, in Europe from the US, uh, is uh, the movement around Black Lives Matters, which is a very important mm -hmm. movement. But uh, it also raises the question how much identity politics is really an answer that really provides a perspective for the future. Can you comment mm -hmm. on that? How uh, Black Lives Matters is essential also to uh, really face the, uh, the, the slave tradition Uh, mm. in, in the U.S. and the white supremacy that's still occurring, not just in the U.S., but also uh, the question, is this uh, for an integral progressive uh, agenda, a focus that is helpful or more problematic? Mm. Mm. Really good question, and it's a very difficult one to answer. <laughs> I think in integral circles, actually, it's been a very heated topic, uh, a, a lot of debate, at least online. Um, so I, 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 have a, I have a complex relationship with what they call identity politics. On the one hand, I think the rise of, let's say, Black Lives Matter uh, this uh, during the pandemic this year um, as a social movement has been really inspiring because there were really asking for institutional changes, right? They're asking for, they had a, a particular list of demands like restructuring the police and police reform, uh, uh, allocating of, of, of uh, financial support and structural support for other things like, you know, public health uh, um, and, and other kind of mutual aid oriented focuses. So that's good. Um, On the other hand, I know that identity politics has been to some capacity used as a, used as a kind of, um, or, or a separated from, uh, social, uh, social justice has been separated from economic justice. And I think they really need to be seen as entangled with one another. Uh, you know, I th there's that famous, uh, this is before Black Lives Matter, but there was that famous, uh, Pepsi commercial during Occupy. Right, that Pepsi is the drink of of uh, of the anti-globalists or something along those lines. Uh, uh, there is this emphasis, right, that uh, neoliberal capitalism can subsume identity politics into itself and continue the same economic uh, ideology, and that's that's just intractable. So there's a lot of complexities here. Um, on the other side of things, I think the macro perspective again. Uh, the rise of, of, uh, let's say, you know, a, a changing attitudes, let's say, about Columbus in the United States or colonization, right? There's a decolonization movement. I think these are, these are a healthy indication that we're really, uh, beginning to shift or readjust in terms of, um, Uh, having a sort of Eurocentric or, or uh, Western-centric attitude on things. I think, you know, the post-colonial or what they say in the humanities, the post-human in terms of the post-humanities, uh, the, the kind of Eurocentric uh, canon of thinking and policymaking and philosophy, these are all good things. It's, it's diversifying uh, and truly planetizing Uh, a, a lot of different perspectives. I recognize that they, they can be also very, um, uh, 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 well, a, a site of a, quite a lot of polemics, right? Because if, if we are going to be tearing down statues, uh, there's going to be 
uh, a natural reversion uh, of that by, say, like the MAGA folks, right, that are seeing their own kind of mythologized histories turn, uh, torn down. And to some degree, we want to align ourselves with this emancipatory act, but we also need to do a lot of remediation and healing and integration. And I don't know if right now is the best, and the folks who are, you know, um, uh, part of this eruption of, of, of social justice consciousness. I don't know if, if the timing is appropriate right now to talk about that, but I do think this is something we're going to have to consider is like, we all are going to have to live in this future together, right? Everyone's going to be dealing with this climate crisis. So what do we do with each other? Um, besides kill each other, right? Um, we have to find some kind of way of remediation. And I don't think that's necessarily been addressed this year. But like I'm saying, maybe that's okay. You know, maybe we needed this eruption to really kind of stabilize this consciousness and really bring it online in the culture. Right now, uh, you're still in the middle of the election. I mean, the election are done, but uh, you still don't have a president. Uh, let's assume uh, that Biden will uh, be the next president of the United States of America, what would be a right response to the situation? How to respond to a centrist, uh, traditional democratic government, more conservative? How can a different, an integral, progressive agenda develop? What are steps that can be the right steps in this situation? Mm. In terms of the Biden administration, like let's say they they yeah. win, what would what would a progressive integral agenda look like? No, in in terms of a response of a progressive movement to the Biden administration. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, you're saying Trump's response? Sorry. Oh, uh, the, a progressive response. Oh, a progressive response. Well, you know, again, I think um, the answer won't be. To, to 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 take the Biden administration head on, I think let, let's bring it to Gebser for a moment in his definition of, of integrality or integral consciousness mm-hmm. or the eight perspective of world. Um, what he talks about is is the integral world is the move away from this mentality we've been discussing, the sense making mentality of the uh, the abstract, the progressive, the uh, and I mean this in progressive in the sense of, you know, higher and higher stages or more and more meta levels or uh, whatever we kind of, uh, however we kind of imagine this sort of abstractive oriented style of thinking. And it's a move back into, as Gebser says, the concrete into the material. It's, it's almost a, in a certain sense, bringing back the magical capacity to be attuned and to listen and to listen to where we are in a material sense, right? So what are the concerns on the ground? Um, what are the material needs on the ground? And how can transformation of culture and consciousness uh, find its way into, you know, the, the most concretized forms of social institutions that we have like economics and social structure so i think an integral per, uh, perspective here would be let's get back to the ground um, we don't need to be direct and fight the biden administration necessarily but i do think we need to change and redirect culture and that requires us meeting each other face to face that requires us in some sense humanizing and personalizing not politics but economics, uh, you know, people are craving connection with each other. We mentioned earlier, the erosion of the commons and third spaces has created a very atomized, alienated culture in a meeting crisis. So I think the answer is to, is to lean back into the human, right? And this is one of the reasons why my, my, my buddies, uh, Matt Hudkins and, and Ryan Nakati call our podcast project, uh, Growing Down. We borrow it from James Hillman, uh, and he meant it sort of in a soul-making sense to grow down into into your 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 life's uh, um, uh, archetypal uh, struggles and pathos, and to really live it. Well, I think in this aspect, it's like well, we need to really kind of grow down into the material and promote a kind of culture 
that is human centric again, right? That, um, you know, one other example might be like with, uh, my, my late friend, uh, the great Michael Brooks, when he says, you know, be ruthless to institutions, but be kind to people. Um, can we build a politics? Can we build a culture around that, actually? So much of our problems today in terms of the meaning crisis and online polemics, uh, and a kind of a dissociation from, you know, what's going on with the climate crisis, right? The sort of denialism or living in our own reality tunnels, um, has been because, you know, our mediated environments tend to be very abstracting and, uh, the internet, we can even say, is a kind of uh, uh, prosthesis or uh, a desiring for connection with one another again. But, you know, on the ground, that's not actually happening, right? Like, we have a lot of heat, but do we have light? And I think, again, that the movement now has to be back to the human, down to the ground, towards concretization, towards embodiment. Um, and I think where we're seeing effective... Uh, effective transformations and, and, and positive directions in terms of, you know, uh, hopeful best case scenarios and, 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 uh, ho hopeful stories during 2020. It has been where that has been the focus and where we've seen some of the biggest crises that has also been the focus, mutual aid, uh, human centric economics being ignored, right? What's going on on the ground? Um, We've got had the largest transfer of wealth, as I mentioned before, in, in modern history. Uh, the stock market's doing great, but yet, you know, in the United States, unemployment, uh, the working class, people on the ground are not. So there's, there's a, there's been a further dissociation. So I think the answer is actually to kind of, you know, reverse that, right? And retrieve what it means to be on the ground as a human being again and move away from both economic and social models that are way too dissociative and way too abstract oriented and that's really difficult right because this is a this is a shift in the structure of consciousness we just have a tendency economically politically technologically to produ produce a kind of cartesian situation um and it's interesting how the internet is sort of both an expression of perhaps you know what the future could be like in terms of networks and, and decentralization and it is also an expression of the same cartesianism that you know modernity has really been fixated on or, or um possessed by not sure if that last part made sense but growing down i think would be my answer for you in terms of wh what can we do that's efficient and effective where do you see this happening uh, in terms of um, the United States, uh, or not even the United States, I think uh, at the at the global level, I think during the pandemic, we've seen a really exciting uh, revivification of common centric projects from urban gardening uh, due to concerns about you know resource supply. Um, food gardens or food commons in urban spaces. There's an interesting paper um, of one case study in Portugal. Um, there's number of a number of really great and successful, uh, as I mentioned earlier, down ballot races uh, from uh, the DSA, the Democratic Socialist uh, Organization here in the United States, that have run on a lot of these human centric uh, policies. You know, okay. Uh, one example might be, you know, Florida, and this is sort of a, a, a coming back to the, the the politics of the race here with the, the Democratic leadership. But Florida went Trump, but they also voted in for fifteen dollar minimum wage. Uh, so, so the hunger for, you know, the, the desire for material needs to be met can't be understated. And uh, I think we've seen a lot of successes, as I said, about seventy percent of uh, uh, progressive candidates uh, endorsed by the DSA had victories uh, during this election, which is great. And hopefully we'll continue in terms of the midterms in, in, in uh, two years from now. So I see it a, 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 a slow shift. And there, you know, during the primaries even as well, we've seen, uh, you know, Bernie's near, I mean, maybe he wasn't as close as we thought he was, uh, to winning the election, but he came pretty darn close to being the Democratic front runner and it shocked everyone. 
all of the pundits were trying to rationalize how and why this was the case and why he was doing so well in uh, Arizona and Nevada, et cetera. Um, and, and it's because of the on-the-ground work he was doing. There's a wonderful example of um, his um, his campaigners uh, showing up, I think, at like 4 a.m. in front of a factory to talk to working-class, multiracial employer employees, and uh, and you know, saying that they'll fight for their for their rights, you know, for their health care. And it worked. It worked. Jeremy, we are at the end of our time here. Uh, the people who are listening to this live, we have a chance to talk with you in 50 minutes at the top of the hour uh, in our Zoom forum. I give everyone the number again in case you don't have it. It's the Zoom number 5397861711. And uh, we are very happy to uh, talk with you in this room number. And um, thank you very much for these insights. Thank you very much to talk to us in this very, uh, yeah, unknown, exciting, uh, but also hopeful times. And uh, let's continue this conversation in 50 minutes and uh, see you there. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Thomas.